Okay, I think we're ready to get started. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, good morning, North America. Good afternoon, Europe. And good middle of the night for those few of you joining us from Australia and Asia. Um, I'm happy to give a presentation today on the topic of Dragonfly for Amazon Cloud. Judging from the response rate from this announcement, I'm beginning to think there are a lot of people stuck at home with time to watch webinars. So um, before I get into today's topic, I just want everyone to know that we will be running a webinar series uh, every day starting next week. These will be five to 15 minute webinars mostly covering daily Dragonfly tutorials. And these will start at pretty simple topics so experienced users won't get too much out of the first week or the first two weeks. Um, but if there's demand, we'll keep going and we'll progress to advanced topics. So um, tune in for those if you like and uh, feel free to send in suggestions for future topics. Now, today's webinar, we're going to talk about Dragonfly on the cloud, and this is a new product we're announcing today. We think it's going to have a lot of use for some users. It won't fit everybody's needs, but we're going to tell you about the pros and the cons of running Dragonfly in the cloud and to help you determine whether it's a good fit for your organization. I'm going to start out by talking about um, where you run Dragonfly, what it means to run Dragonfly on the workstation or something called the Viz server or the cloud. And I'll even touch on a, on a feature new for another feature new for 2020 called Dragonfly HPC. Um, after we get through that, we'll talk about uh, what it, the benefits are of running in the cloud. So we'll talk about um, how flexible it is, the advantages of the reliability and the economics. We'll also talk about the system requirements of running on the cloud, which make it very easy. There's a very low barrier to entry. Then we'll talk about the cons of cloud computing, um, maybe challenging for the way you normally budget for your computing and data management may be different from what you're used to. Um, then we'll talk about mechanically what it means to run Dragonfly in the cloud, how soon you can get started. And then we'll take some questions and answers. So um, uh, I'm gonna start on this topic, where is Dragonfly running? But before I dive into that, we do have about 75 people signed up today who are not current Dragonfly users. So we're not going to talk about what Dragonfly is for more than this one slide. So we could talk for hours and hours about what Dragonfly is. But for those of you that are not already using Dragonfly, uh, all you really need to know is if you generate scientific imaging and you want to do quantitative analysis on scientific images, then Dragonfly is designed for you. So it's visualization, inspection, um, a lot of effort poured into having the best image segmentation tools that give you the sort of quantitative analysis and reporting you need. So that's all we're gonna talk about what Dragonfly is today. If you wanna learn how to use Dragonfly, there are many tutorials online, and of course we'll start that tutorial series next week. So where do you run Dragonfly is really what today's discussion is about. So before today, uh, everyone who's run Dragonfly installs it on a desktop computer. So they have a computer sitting at their desk, it may be actually sitting on their desk or a tower sitting by their feet, but this Dragonfly is installed on this Windows or Linux workstation and you use your mouse and keyboard connected to that workstation to control and process your data and that's how you run Dragonfly. Now, what we can do starting in 2020 is instead of installing it on that workstation, you can actually install it on a server. So this would be something we call a Viz server. And so it would uh, normally be maintained by your IT department and it would be somewhere on premises. And when you install it on a server, different users can connect and run Dragonfly at the same time. Now Dragonfly is actually running on the server but you have the experience like it's running on your own computer sitting on your desk. And so the computer running on your desk, really it just needs a web browser. So it could be a, a MacBook or it could be a Chromebook or a regular desktop or laptop. And you feel like you're running it inside your computer and it feels fast and responsive, but it's actually running on the server. So this solution allows you to invest in a server and support multiple users simultaneously and you have one point of maintenance. So you don't have to upgrade Dragonfly on everybody's workstation, you upgrade it in one place and then everyone can uh, take advantage of the centralized hardware. Now this is what happens when you have a server that is on premises maintained by your IT department. If you replace that with servers run in the cloud maintained by your cloud service provider, then you have Dragonfly on cloud. So the Dragonfly is running on the cloud and you have control over the configuration and you can connect again from any local computer that's sitting on your desk where you're working. So there are almost no requirements. So this can be, again, uh, lightweight laptops, computers without GPUs, etc. So that's Dragonfly on cloud. Now I am gonna dive into one simple topic um, 
This won't interest most of you, but for complete lists, I do need to discuss what Dragonfly HPC is. So this is really only relevant for people that are interested in running on clusters or doing compute jobs, uh, distributed compute jobs. If that's not you, then you can just tune out for the next two or three slides. The, here, if you are doing jobs, you are, you are the client, and you may wish to run the same image processing on 100 samples, or you may wish to run an image filter with 25 different parameters. And instead of having an operator click the button 25 times, you may set up a batch job, and you can batch a job to a taskmaster, and then the taskmaster can take on multiple jobs and then delegate those jobs to some computer that's going to do them for you. So you can go off and drink your coffee and some slave is doing all of these jobs for you. When it finishes the job, it returns the results to the taskmaster and then passes that back to the client. This whole infrastructure is designed so that in fact, instead of a single slave, you can have multiple slaves. And this way, if you have a high performance compute cluster and you want to do dozens and dozens or hundreds and hundreds of jobs, you can dispatch them this way. So this solution, which I've described, can exist on an on-premises HPC cluster, or if you wanted to, you could run it on the cloud. That's not something we normally support, but that's something we've done uh, uh, to, for our own use when we've needed to run compute jobs. We've run Dragonfly HPC in the cloud. So this is not for interactive use. This is for batch processing. So let me summarize what I mean by workstation, by Viz server, and by cloud. So first of all, let's not talk about HPC anymore. That's for batch processing. So instead, let's talk about workstation, Viz server, and cloud. These are all for interactive use. So the standard use of Dragonfly, you just put it on a workstation and one person can use it. And your performance is fixed based on the hardware you have sitting on that workstation. And you probably spend your department budget to buy the workstation and your IT to budget to maintain the workstation and any electricity used may come out of, out of your overhead. Contrast that to Viz server where still for interactive use, but typically one to eight users connecting at a time. The performance is fixed based on whatever hardware you installed in your IT service room based on that hardware. Now this is an expensive computer where this workstation that comes out of your department budget, maybe a three to $10,000 workstation, maybe even a $15,000 workstation for people that want their performance. The Viz server is something more on the order of 20 to $80,000, supports multiple users and has very high performance hardware. So this can be very advantageous for supporting multiple users and again, centralizing your resources. And again, your maintenance costs come out of an IT budget. Now, cloud computing is interactive, but the number of users is dynamic. You may have one user one day, you could have 30 users another day. The performance is quite flexible. It turns out, and we'll see this in a minute, that when you start up your cloud computer, you can decide, do I need a high performance computer today or do I need a more economical computer today? And whereas this Viz server may be spending twenty dollars to $80,000 out of your capital expenditure budget, you don't do that with a cloud. You just pay an hourly rate as you go. Um, and those maintenance costs are actually baked into that hourly rate. So you're not uh, foregoing funds out of your IT budget to maintain an expensive Viz server. Uh, and the electricity costs are also baked in. So that's sort of the philosophical difference between running on on-premises computers that are either in your lab or in your IT room versus running on computers that are in the cloud. So the pros of cloud computing, first is flexibility. And by flexibility, I wanna say that it's elastic. So it stretches to fit your needs. And you may need one computer today you may need no computers tomorrow. Um, and then you may need 12 computers on Monday because you're teaching a, a course or you have a, a workshop where you have a bunch of processing going on. So it really is dynamic and stretches to fit your needs. And the billing rates, at least with Amazon Cloud, um, are on a second per second level. So it's not like if you want to use the computer for a few minutes today, you have to pay for a full day. You're, you pay down to the, uh, the billing is done um, by second in increments of second with a 60 second minimum. And so that's going to vary depending on your cloud service provider and what region you're in. But that's the, uh, the sort of flexibility that's afforded by cloud computing. It's also scalable. So you can go big and expensive or you can go light and economical. This means you can use that cheap computer to work on simple tasks. And by cheap computer for something that has a GPU that, that 
uh, can accomplish dragonfly visualization and rendering, this might be one to two dollars an hour. And you can use an expensive computer, but restrict that usage for more complicated tasks. So these are tasks that are compute intensive or memory intensive. And these are systems where you, you might use, for example, a, a nearly 500 gigabyte system memory system for on the order of $8 an hour. And this is exactly how we use cloud computing at ORS. Um, my colleagues uh, sometimes want to process data and they're not near a computer, so they may use a, a cloud instance. And we have a data set. So someone gave us a 140 gigabyte scan of a sheep femur. And we didn't have any computers in the office that had enough system memory. So when we needed to process that, we just started up a 480 gigabyte instance on Amazon. And then we paid for the hours we processed. And of course, we only spent a few hundred dollars to get that processing done versus having to buy a system that could handle all of that uh, data. The second feature or pro of cloud computing is reliability. It's very consistent. You're always going to get the same experience. There's a fleet of online computers waiting to serve you. You always start up from a clean system. So you'll come to understand that you'll have a, a computer that looks like a Microsoft Windows operating system. Uh, you could also choose Linux, but today we'll just talk about Windows. It'll, it'll look like you're running Windows right there in your browser, and it'll have Dragonfly installed and nothing else, or maybe a few things that you configure. But you can work in that environment, and then when you shut down, um, anything that may, uh, may have accumulated is basically reset. So every time you start up, you're starting with a clean system. So it's consistent and clean. Uh, it's dependable. When things fail... Uh, they're getting fixed by the cloud service professional, so you don't know about it. There's no waiting on an IT person to order new hard drives or order that RAM upgrade and then schedule the fix. Things are just uh, happening. Um, they're done for you by the service provider. Now, there's also the issue of the economics. What you pay for with your conventional on-premises computers, you, of course, have to purchase the equipment and you pay your power bill. You have maintenance expense, which... Uh, is harder to figure for most uh, operational scientists because it's it's not uh, it's a bit opaque for them. But you are uh, paying someone to run a data backup system. You do have to replace parts when they fail. There is the effort install efforts associated with installing and configuring software, with maintaining your network, etc. You also pay network transfer fees, and of course that's that may be in your overhead at your organization. When you're in the cloud, you also have fees. So you pay for usage time, you pay for data storage, and you pay for data transfer. We'll talk a little bit more about these fees on the next slide. And data storage can be quite different. There are different tiers of data storage. Sometimes you want your data stored where it's very fast and accessible. And sometimes you want a more economical storage where maybe you don't get uh, blazing speeds like an NVMe drive. Maybe you just need um, normal hard drive speeds or normal network transfer speeds. So as an example for the economics, I'm going to illustrate an example use case, and this could vary wildly depending on your needs. But suppose, just for a moment, that you needed to run Dragonfly for 15 hours a week. Now, I'm going to show you some prices here. These are not uh, ORS prices. These are approximate prices that Amazon charges their customers. So these are the sort of fees you might expect if you were to move to the cloud and uh, sign up and do business with Amazon. So, for example, if you were using um, computers that go from a dollar an hour to, to two dollars an hour, maybe you split your time on, on different systems and you accumulated 15 hours a week or maybe 60 hours a month, then you might spend $90 um, in the month for that one person to process 15 hours a week. Data storage. Data storage can be quite nuanced, and we can dive into this in, an, in another webinar or in future online documentation. But there are certain storage fees associated for how you store your operating system and software, and there are storage fees for storing your data. So let's suppose you're working, you're a paleontologist, and you're working on scans from your last few digs, and you're going to store 500 gigabytes so that your different graduate students and postdocs may log in from time to time and work on those different scans. For that, you may have $20 a month of recurring cost. So that might be an approximate cost for storing 500 gigabytes of data month to month. And then whenever you delete those data from the server, then those, those costs go away. Data transfer, it doesn't actually cost you anything to upload your data to the cloud. It's only when you want to download data from the cloud. And it can actually be expensive if you're trying to move terabytes of data back and forth all the time. 
However, for Dragonfly users, we suggest that you may put your data in the cloud, and when you process the data, you're just pulling out results. And we can describe maybe in questions and answers if you want, why those results are usually not very heavy in their um, hundreds of megabytes, sometimes maybe a few gigabytes, but not tens of gigabytes. And so your data download speeds are not very much. So in this case, and your case may vary quite wildly from this, but in this case, using 15 hours a week, we might say you would accrue $114 of expense to get some processing done. So you think about what a graduate student or what a worker costs you, and uh, it's a very modest uh, cost over that. So, um, and then of course, if you extrapolated having four users working on the cloud, each doing 15 hours a month, um, you might have the same storage cost, you might have the same download cost, because maybe they're working on the same fossils and, and you're, you're just still downloading them, but you're having multiple people work on them, and you're just paying more usage times. Um, in that case, you may go up to, say, nearly $400 a month. And just to contrast this, in the cloud, let's say you were paying this $384 a month times 12 months a year, this might be four or $5,000 a year, and that's to support four simultaneous users. So the advantages here are that the users can use better computers when they want. They, you could have 20 users when necessary. And when you go down to one user because group members have left the lab, then you're not paying for users you're not using. So it's quite flexible. Now, if you were doing on-premises work, suppose a workstation, suppose you didn't have a super high budget and you were only spending $4,000 per workstation, you know, you may have two workstations and that costs you $8,000. Let's say you upgrade every four years, that works out to your amortized workstation cost of about $2,000 a year. Now, this may be cheaper, but this is only for two simultaneous users instead of four. The users are stuck with one type of workstation. That workstation can't magically change into a high performance computer one day and a cheaper computer the next day. The users are gonna have to work in shifts if you have four users and only two workstations. And the money is spent whether you use the computers or not. It's not a pay as you go. And then of course, there's occasional downtime for maintenance. So the economics usually are advantageous for cloud computing, but they differ for different people. It's very much like shopping for a computer. Everyone's gonna have different needs. So when it comes time to decide is cloud computing right for you, there's a lot to look at in the economics, but we can help you and discuss that with you if you like. The system requirements on your end, what you need on your desk, doesn't really matter. So you just need a modern web browser. So this could be a web browser running on Microsoft Windows computer or Mac or Linux or Chrome OS or really anything at all. The hardware you need, you need basically a keyboard, a mouse and a monitor. The GPU almost doesn't matter. Um, really, if it's fast enough to drive a web browser, then it's almost always gonna be useful. Uh, it's almost always gonna be good enough and you don't need a GPU. So that greatly reduces the hardware requirements on your end. Um, network wise, really just any modern connected internet. I wouldn't try this with dial up, but I've used Dragonfly Cloud on, with my mobile phone as a hotspot. So it, uh, you'll find that you don't have to be on a, on a super low latency internet connection. Most modern internet connections uh, do quite well. As far as accessibility, like I say, you just need a connection to the network. There are, when you are running in the cloud, you are running on a computer that is actually in some physical location. Um, we have done workshops in the United States where we have used computers in Ohio and we have connected from Florida, from Montreal, from Pennsylvania, from San Francisco, and the performance is always great. It's never uh, a latency issue, so you don't have to worry that you're on the other side of the continent. We've used the Frankfurt Data Center for doing a workshop, I think it was, I think it was in Southampton last fall. So um, the data center does not need to be that close to you, but there are there are data centers in different regions. So I wouldn't want to use a Tokyo data center if you were in the middle of Europe because there would be some latency fee. But basically don't worry, the internet is faster than your mouse. And what I mean by that is when you have, uh, when it only takes uh, 50 to 200 milliseconds to send signals to and from the computer, most people are not thinking that fast and moving their mouse that fast. So the computer is able to take your signal and process a response and send it to you before you're able to send it another signal. So networks uh, take care of it. 
the cons of cloud computing, really the biggest con is budget forecasting. You need to pay attention to your usage. So the month to month cost could be highly variable. I mean, you may be using 20 computers one week and then use no computers at all for the next month. So it's a little different than just saying, I need budget approval for a $5,000 computer and then buying it. So that changes things a little bit and that may be uh, disruptive for some labs and how they operate. Managing data is a little bit different than when you're running locally. There are multiple tiers of data storage um, in these different cloud service providers. So we could look and talk about that. Data transfer, as I mentioned, uploading to the cloud is free. Downloads can be costly. So I say about 10 cents per gigabyte. So, you know, if you've got a, if you need to download a terabyte of data, that's a $10 fee. A terabyte is quite a bit of data. So you're going to find that you're not going to need to download a terabyte of data very often. Um, but you might want to do some planning to avoid unnecessary downloads. Okay, so what does it mean to be running Dragonfly in the cloud? Well, basically look at the top line bullets here. You turn on a computer, you do your work, you shut down your computer. When you're in the cloud, turning on your computer is a couple extra steps. You log into, in this case, the Amazon Web Services control panel. You choose your desired computer, what they call an instance type. Do you want one with half a terabyte of RAM or just 30 gigabytes of RAM and eight CPUs and an eight gigabyte GPU, for example? Um, choose what you want and then you start up that computer with your Dragonfly Ready operating system. And so that's pre-configured in your account. So you launch your computer, then you just take the web browser on your local computer and you type in the right address and boom, you're in your operating system, you're logged in, you're running Dragonfly, you upload data if it's not already there, you process data, you make movies, you find your answers, you write reports. So everything you would normally do on the desktop. Then you close Dragonfly, then you go back to the control panel and shut it down. So um, we'll have some instructional videos on how this actually works. And so uh, we do this in our workshops all the time, and we'll, we'll make some videos so that you'll see how you can do this if you're running a Dragonfly on your own Amazon Cloud account. So licensing, the way licensing works for our general use license holders, for our commercial customers, if you already have a Dragonfly or a Dragonfly Pro, then you can just buy the Dragonfly Cloud extension and that unlocks your license for use in Amazon Cloud. Uh, your existing license key gets upgraded. In most cases, we don't even need to issue you a new license key. It just gets upgraded according to our server records. And then you can use that Dragonfly license and you can launch on the desktop or the cloud as needed. So you can use it at work when you need it and uh, or on the cloud as you need it. If you only have one license and you can only be running it one at a time, you can't have it running both places at the same time. If you do that, you would just need to purchase a second license. The requirements here is of course a valid Dragonfly license, in this case covered by a, a maintenance and support plan. If you're out of support, we can talk to you about getting, getting current and getting covered. And you have to be running Dragonfly 4.1.1 or higher, where that's gonna be an update that uh, should be available next Tuesday. If you wanna know about the pricing of the cloud extension, uh, email my colleague Bill at sales at the objects.com and he can tell you about the the pricing so you can unlock it on your Dragonfly or Dragonfly Pro. If you're a non-commercial user, so you still need the extension basically, but it's included on all licenses that are covered by a maintenance and support plan. So if you already have a maintenance and support plan, just contact us. We'll make sure your license key is updated. If you don't have a maintenance and support plan, these cost uh, a little more than $2,000 a year. And that's basically the support plan that means you get email and telephone support. It also simplifies your license management because you just get one key you can share with your whole research group. And of course, as I say, it includes the Dragonfly Cloud. We're also launching a, a public Dragonfly product roadmap this year. And when you have a maintenance and support plan, you get to cast votes to say, these are the features I would like to see in Dragonfly soon. So it helps you have some influence on our product roadmap. But the short of it is, um, if you already have a Dragonfly non-commercial license and you don't have a support plan, then you can pay $22.50 and get a support plan. And that unlocks it not just for your one computer, but for all the computers in your group. At that point, you have paid for the Dragonfly license and then um, you just follow our instructions of how to create your own account on Amazon Cloud and you can maintain an Amazon Cloud account and pay whatever Amazon fees for your usage. And you don't pay any more fees to Dragonfly. You've already paid for your, your Dragonfly uh, and your Dragonfly Cloud extension. Um, there is the issue of getting your data into the cloud. We will be talking more about that in some of our instructional videos. Um, but there's, for example, a web portal where you can go and then just choose the files you wanna upload. Um, this is if you wanna upload to an Amazon 
a storage tier called S3. There are also third party tools that are sort of a, a drag and drop, kind of like an FTP program that'll upload or download data to your cloud account. If you're in a Dragonfly session on the cloud, there is a button you can click that just will let you upload a data directly to your session when you're logged in. Um, but there are some things you need to look at for that. We can talk more about that if you want, if you want to hear about it. The data persists um, when you shut down that cloud computer and you restart it, but the, a normal behavior says you, you terminate the cloud computer so it, it stays fresh and the data gets cleared at that point. So there are uh, things you just need to learn about and pay attention so that the storage, the data you're storing is either persistent storage um, and when you don't want that transient storage. When can you start using Dragonfly for Amazon Cloud? Well, the, um, we'll have this new installer um, that turns on the support for Amazon Cloud and that should be available by Tuesday. And that's a Dragonfly 4.1.1 for Windows. If you wanna run it on Linux, we still have a couple of kinks we need to run out, uh, work out, let us know. I don't think we're gonna have many users that want to run on Linux. Although, when you're running on the cloud, the pricing can be cheaper for Linux than for Windows. So we can discuss that and see if, if that's something people want to prioritize of that uh, budgetary cost. Documentation and training videos um, should be going up um, starting next Friday, uh, a week from tomorrow. And these include how to set up your own Amazon AWS account so that you can, um, you can configure and start and launch your, your, your sessions. Also how you can get a customized Dragonfly image that is the um, everything you need to turn on a computer that can run Dragonfly, all you'll have to do is supply your own license key uh, and then you can you know, use Dragonfly. So we'll have some tools for how to, how to customize your own Dragonfly image. That way you don't have to input the key every time, for example. And we'll have some uh, video suggestions on, on data storage and data transfer. So to summarize, you will have Dragonfly access in the cloud and you have the cost, just like in your home lab, you have the cost of buying the computer and the cost of the software. On the cloud, the cost of the software is the same, the same software that you, run, you buy from us, Dragonfly that runs on your home computer can run in the cloud with this cloud extension. And then the cost of the hardware, instead of buying the hardware, you work with a, your own cloud service provider with a pay as you go. So, um, I just want to encourage you to stick with Dragonfly. Um, I think a lot of you are already Dragonfly users. You know why it's a great platform. We have uh, amazing ease of use and we have amazing uh, Python integration. Lots of things we could talk about for hours and hours. We have some features you won't find anywhere else. And to that now we're adding the fact that Dragonfly is cloud ready. Now, um, so just to recap, you know, sort of the pros of cloud computing, it's scalable and elastic, highly reliable. The economics, um, work out very well when you sometimes need a high performance computer and you sometimes don't. So you can rent the computer by the hour. System requirements on your end, basically a keyboard, a mouse, and a web browser. So um, I hope that's given you some idea of how you run Dragonfly. Um, I appreciate your time during today's webinar. What I'm going to do now is we're going to go into questions and answers. Um, Brian asks, is pricing and licensing for the Viz server the same as the cloud? So let's see. Um, uh, I think, yeah, I'm trying to see my control panels of who's going to answer that. I'll go ahead and uh, answer that question. The Viz server is, is quite different. Um, the Viz server is a uh, solution where you buy an annual fee. Um, it is uh, similar in that it's an, an annual fee to unlock it, but uh, it's uh, it's a different pricing model, and so and it, it's quite different for academic. But my colleague uh, Bill at sales at salesattheobjects.com can uh, uh, assess your needs and then come up with the right price for the Viz server for you. So we're happy to take care of that. Um, let's see. I don't know how to. Uh, it is marked as answered. Perfect. Uh, the next question David asks is cloud computing just through Amazon? Is there a Google service in the future? Uh, great question, David. Um, for now. Um, it is working on Amazon, and that's because that is the biggest cloud provider that has the most market share. Um, there's no reason we can't also support Microsoft Azure in the future, uh, Google, and even some other smaller players. This really is, is going to depend on demand from our customers. If some of our customers say, look, we already have a contract with Microsoft Azure, we really want to be able to run Dragonfly there, then we can add that support. Um, but we just haven't committed to running to any other cloud providers. So in the event that we do add support, if you happen to purchase a cloud license for Amazon, 
that cloud license will unlock for any of the cloud providers that we choose to provide in the future. So you wouldn't have to buy a separate cloud license at that point. All right, the next question. Um, so I have a question from Nancy. Uh, my facility uses a single node Dragonfly Pro license. Can we give our users the license information so they can independently use Dragonfly on the cloud? Yes, so Nancy, what would happen is if you wanted to buy the cloud extension, then you could um, then share that one license key with your entire team and then any one of them at a time could log into one of your Amazon cloud instances and use Dragonfly Pro in the cloud. Um, it would still be limited to just one user at a time, but it would, uh, they could run on the cloud or if you have a computer in the office, they could run it there. Um, so I'm going to go on to uh, Arrestus's question. Is there any cost associated with generating data while processing in the cloud? So not downloading or uploading. So generating secondary volumes after applying filters. Great question. So if I have a 20 gigabyte data set and I run an image filter and I generate another 20 gigabyte data set, um, it's a very nuanced question to answer. So, but I can, I can take it now. When you have a Dragonfly running, you have a virtual hard drive. So you might imagine that you have a 500 gigabyte um, hard drive computer running Dragonfly, a virtual 500 gigabyte. And so Dragonfly is taking up a couple of gigabytes and you've got you know, 480 gigabytes uh, free for space. And you're paying for that total amount of space at the time. So you're paying in that scenario, as long as that computer is turned on, you're paying 500 gigabytes, you're paying that 10 cents per gigabyte month, but you're only gonna have that session open for, for a few hours. So you're not paying, you know, uh, it's not gonna cost you uh, $5 to maintain um, that session, not even $5 for the whole month, because it's gonna be transient. And again, it's, it's quite subtle, but you're paying for all of those empty bytes. So if you, you're working and you have a 10 gigabyte uh, sample loaded there, and then you filter it two or three times, you're writing those 10 gigabyte data sets to your virtual disk. And if you save them um, to your persistent storage, then you'll, you'll pay for that storage fee at one or two cents per gigabyte month. If you're just experimenting with them, then um, as soon as you close that session, then that storage that was transient goes away and you're not paying for it. Um, I, can, I can take that question offline for you know, the, the 30 minute answer to that question rather than the, the two minute answer to that question, but we'll consider that question answered for now. Okay, um, I have another question from Kazuyuki. Kazuyuki asks, what about latency? If I click the button, uh, how quick is the action or the redraw happen? So um, what happens is if you have a 3D visualization and you're rotating the model in real time, you feel like you're sitting there rotating it. Um, if you're zooming in, the same thing. So you can pan and zoom and rotate. Um, and of course you can click buttons and get menu items to come up. Um, it all uh, it all feels uh, very interactive. So um, we can maybe do a demo for you or a range demo where you can run it from your site so you could see it for yourself. But uh, you'll find that um, it may feel like there's a tiny bit of latency um, on the order of 50 to 150 milliseconds. Um, I find this uh, zoom feels there feels something like there's a slight lag, but nothing at all disruptive that makes it harder to uh, visualize or process your data. All right. And uh, I just want to add that there are many locations for the cloud providers around the world. So there's most likely one that's closer to you. So you won't really notice the actual latency. Um, uh, thank you, Eric. All right, uh, the next question Arisus asks, can you have guests watching the data handling and processing for your session? That's a great question. Um, once you have created a session and you, you can log in and go to work on it, um, if you give the username and password for that session to someone else, they can log in. Um, you can have a situation where uh, 10 different people are logged in and viewing, and uh, if they're not disciplined, then they can all be fighting for the mouse and all stealing control. So that's only gonna happen if uh, you give them the address uh, to connect and the password. But if you wanted to use it for a training or demonstration session, yes, you could have uh, as many people logged in and viewing as you want, um, and, uh, and they, they would all use the same password to connect. All right, um, uh, so uh, is the image quality the same as using the local computer? Yes, so again, you can see this in a trial, but uh, you're, uh, the, there's not a compression that makes it feel like your image data is all uh, 
like your images are hard to interpret. It doesn't look like a, it's like watching a DVD versus watching a film in the theater. Um, there might be compression, but uh, it's at sort of at the limits of human perception. So um, it, the image quality is, is outstanding. And of course, any of the results you process, there's no image quality. I'm just talking about the on-screen display. There could be a image compression, but for results you compute, there's no image quality trade-off. It's exactly the same as if you process locally. So we'll mark that question. Uh, as answered. Um, Marshall asks, how about student licenses? So I, um, so yes, so the, the issue is, of course, uh, if you're in a non-commercial group and you need to run on the cloud, um, that is permissible as long as you have the maintenance and support plan. And so uh, if you're, if you're, if you want to upgrade to that plan, you can upgrade once for the group and that would take care of all of the students in your group. And it's not really an upgrade, it's just, it's just choosing to pay for the help and support plan so you get our technical support and get the cloud feature unlocked. Um, Brian asks, uh, is there a breakdown of uh, what analysis and filter methods are CPU based versus GPU based and help you decide which type of instance to launch? Okay, well, that's a good question. So um, fundamentally, you always need um, a GPU at least for the visualization. Um, and you might be asking, okay, well, I've determined I can get away with an eight gigabyte GPU for visualization, but I wanna know, do I need a 16 gigabyte GPU? Cause I wanna do a lot of GPU intensive processing. Um, it turns out that right now in Dragonfly, um, all of the filters are implemented on the CPU. Um, if you as a user are having an experience where you are using image filters and you think they are uh, too slow, then please talk with us. We're always looking for ways to improve performance. If you think some of the CPU filters are too slow and they need to be implemented on GPU, then we'll investigate that. That's certainly not a problem. However, right now they're all on CPU. However, the question um, must consider the fact that if you wish to do deep learning, um, that is a GPU activated feature. So you need to consider how much GPU do I need for my volume rendering, but also maybe how much GPU do I need if I'm gonna do deep learning in this session. And so if you're gonna do a lot of deep learning, you may fire up a session with a, a higher performance GPU. All right, the next question um, from Mohamed Reza is, uh, is there an educational discount for Amazon Cloud? Gosh, uh, I don't know. Um, I, I, sorry, I can't answer that. You'll have to talk with Amazon. I suppose that many universities and institutions are forming institutional um, contracts with Amazon where they're getting special contract rates. Um, so for example, there are uh, definitely government contract rates for def different, different government labs that are running on Amazon, but I don't know if there's a general educational account for an individual for any university. But as your university decides to migrate more and more of their IT and computing to the cloud, they're very likely to be engaged in a competitive contract with Amazon. Um, I'll go into the next question. Greg asks, I have two Dragonfly Pro licenses. When I process my data at local workstation, it takes hours to do some segmentation training. Will it be the same when I process from the cloud? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So if you're using, if you're doing deep learning training at home and you're using a, a $500 GPU, you're going to get a certain amount of performance. If you're using a, a $2,500 GPU, you'll get much higher performance. And so it's going to be very much like that in the cloud. We um, could talk offline about a provision we have where you could um, work on one session and then ship off your training um, to a, a slave computer that is just doing GPU um, and how that might become a, a cost to beneficial solution. Um, but that will require a deeper dive and deeper discussion. Um, but basically the answer is uh, if, if you're using a low performance GPU at home, you, you get the same performance when you use a low, low performance GPU in the cloud. Um, and same for high performance. So you might uh, say, I'm gonna spend a $10 an hour per GPU, so it'll go five times faster, and then you don't have to wait so many hours, you only wait a fifth of the time. So that is an option to, to take that GPU-based cloud, take that GPU-based deep learning training and um, run that in a more expensive instance, so it'll go faster. Orestes asks a follow-up question. Um, so the image comes compressed to our monitors, can you turn this option off uh, when gray level calibration is critical? 
um, for example, for medical imaging? Uh, that's a great question. Arrestus, I'm going to connect you to my colleague, Eric Fournier. Um, we've actually addressed this question before in our FDA approved um, product for diagnostic radiology, where we've looked um, a little bit at, uh, at streaming um, diagnostic grade images over the internet um, where you need the uh, the diagnostic radiologist to have all of that gray level information. I don't know the answer. Um, so I'm, I can, uh, we can connect offline. I can connect you to Eric. Um, if you're using this for diagnostics, then maybe we should uh, establish some tests and, and work with you to make sure it's going to meet those needs. I don't want to uh, do anything that would compromise patient care. So let's take that question offline. Um, an anonymous person asks a question about uh, image security. Um, Eric, I think you wanted to um, chime in and address some of that question live. Oh, uh, it depends. What do they mean by image security? If, if you're concerned about um, data security, it's um, you only have access to it. And we, like once it's in Amazon, we have no, no way of accessing your data. Um, the only way we can access it is if you give it to us, like if you somehow give us access or give access to someone else. That's right. So your data storage in Amazon is between you and Amazon. So if you set up a contract and set up an account, um, then whoever has the password to that account or whoever you share it with will have access to your data. Um, ORS and the Dragonfly team will have no access to anything that you don't share unless you give us the password. Um, and likewise, the rest of the world won't be able to access your data uh, as long as you maintain uh, proper passwords. And not only the password, but also the location of the instance, because every instance has their own unique location and, and all of that. So we really have no access to it. Right. Uh, uh, Rodriguez asks, if my lab has one pro license, but I'm using a free non-commercial key at home, can I use my free license on the cloud? Um, so if you have a free license that is through the non-commercial licensing plan, then uh, if it's covered under a support plan, then yes. Uh, if it's not, then you would need to uh, pick up a support plan on that license key. And so that's the, the 2200 a year. And of course, that of course comes with the uh, telephone and email support and the other features of a maintenance plan. Well, thank you all for attending. Um, feel free to email questions. You can email me, mmarsh at theobjects.com. You can email your sales related questions to my colleague, Bill, and uh, uh, that's sales at theobjects.com. Um, look forward to talking with you more in the future. Thanks again for attending. And if you're interested, uh, tune in for some of next week's, um, next week's tutorials. Those also you need to register for. If you haven't registered and you need that registration information, again, uh, just email sales at theobjects.com and we'll connect you. So thanks again, everybody. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, make the best and stay healthy. Cheers, everybody.